So what is anxiety? Uh, Mayo Clinic describes anxiety as a, a, a worrying or a nervousness about daily events. Another medical definition would be an emotion driven by tension, worry, or even a physical change due to an event. I know that uh, anxiety uh, can be kind of like a taboo or kind of a popular topic in the last probably five years. It's really come out on the stage, you know, everybody's got some kind of anxiety or some, and so it, it, it seems like, oh, well, is it a made up thing? Is it just a social thing? Is it a, a, a diagnosis for a, a problem that's n not really a problem? And we're going to look at that. Though anxiety may seem more of a mental or emotional problem, it very quickly can turn into a very physical uh, problem. Uh, what are some of the symptoms, uh, potential ailments caused by extreme levels of anxiety? Now, this is more than just, you know, you're worried a little bit, okay? Um, some extreme symptoms can, you have restlessness, sleeplessness. You, 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 I think I have some of these on here. Uh, uh, feeling nervous, restless or tense, having a tense, uh, a sense of impending danger, panic or doom, uh, having increased heart rate. Now these are, these are more than just like, oh, I'm just worried about something. This is some serious anxiety. anxiety. Trembling, sweating, uh, rapid, uh, breathing rapidly, hi uh, hyperventilation. It's almost like a panic attack, right? I, I don't know if, any, if anybody's suffered from a panic attack or had a panic attack. It's, you feel like you're having a heart attack. You honestly do. You, like, I've had a few of them before, and you just wake up, you sit up in your bed, full sweats, arm almost feels tingly or numb, like am I having a stroke, am I having a heart attack? They can be caused from anxiety. So this is more at an extreme level. Uh, feeling weak or tired, uh, trouble concentrating or thinking about anything other than the present worry, uh, having trouble sleeping, experiencing uh, uh, gastrational uh, problems, ba basically your digestive system having problems with that, having difficulty controlling worry, uh, being consumed by worry, having an urge to avoid things that trigger anxiety. So basically you become secluded from people groups or, or certain situations that cause anxiety, that you know that cause you anxiety, okay? Just based on these last two pages of kind of the symptoms, tendencies of people that suffer with anxiety, I think all of us have had points in our life where we've had some of this, where you try to avoid certain people groups or avoid certain things because you know that just makes you feel uneasy or you worry about it, or maybe you've had some of sweats, even trembling, or have had a panic attack or something caused by anxiety. The topic of anxiety is definitely taboo or popular today. And I can give all kinds of statistics about people that suffer from anxiety and the numbers and the reasons and scenarios, but any topic that we talk about, obviously we're going to base it off of scripture. So is this a made up medical problem or is this a real biblical spiritual problem? It's easy sometimes to give a medical diagnosis to a spiritual problem. I'll say it again. Sometimes it's easier to give a medical diagnosis to a spiritual problem. Well, you're just like Pastor mentioned, like, oh, you know, he's, he's not a thief. He struggles with kleptomania. It's like, no, he's a thief. Okay. So is, is anxiety one of these things where it's just a made up, made up medical term for a spiritual problem? The, uh, this, uh, so this problem, anxiety, is it just made up? social problem or is it a real biblical problem? So we're going to look at a few passages of scripture that talk about this, okay? And we're going to keep this definition in mind. Anxiety being a tension, a worrying or nervousness about daily events or an emotion that's driven by tension, worry, or physical change due to an event. So we're going to go to a few of these passages. Let's go to Deuteronomy 31 first. Deuteronomy 31. Here at the end of the uh, book of Deuteronomy, we have a record of 
uh, the book of Deuteronomy was recording a lot of the movements of the children of Israel, commandments that uh, the Lord had given Moses to give to the people, uh, some charges, things to do, things not to do, uh, how to do those things. Here at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, it's a little bit of history of the children of Israel, and then it finishes by talking about Moses' life, the end of Moses' life, some final charges that uh, Moses gives the people, who's going to be next and chain of command, and so on and so forth. So here at the beginning of Deuteronomy chapter 31, we see that right away, first two, uh, first two verses. And Moses went and spake these words unto all Israel, and he said unto them, I am an hundred and twenty years old this day. This is Moses' birthday. He just turned 120 years old. Let's continue on. I can no more go out and come in. Also the Lord hath said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. It's Moses' birthday party, but it's also his retirement party. This is going to cause some unrest, some worry, some anxiety in the, the whole children of Israel. <clears throat> Moses, who was the prophet of God, who delivered Israel from Pharaoh, who led them through the wilderness. He wrought many miracles by the hand of God. He delivered them the law, the Pentateuch, you know, the first five books uh, of the Bible. He's celebrating his 120th birthday, but he also announces his retirement. Moses had done everything the Lord had commanded him to do up until this point, and he realized that his days of being the leader, his days of, of being you know, the go-to guy, the one that was giving the direction from the Lord, those days are over. Moses was more than just a great leader. To the children of Israel, Moses was a God-sent Savior to the people, their shepherd, and their direct access to God. Nobody else had direct access to God like Moses had. And Moses was, if we look at Scripture, Moses had an extremely unique relationship with God. Moses is the only person, as far as I know, that had God himself come down and bury him, bury his body. And then we see later in Scripture that the archangel and Satan fought over the body of Moses. Why? I don't know. Figure it out yourself. I looked, I couldn't figure out exactly why, but there's something very special about Moses. So Moses isn't just another guy that was leading them. Moses was very special. But here, in the beginning of this chapter, we see that Moses has come to the end of his journey on his 120th birthday. I'm sure as Moses began to relay this message to the people that he was basically putting in his two weeks, the children of Israel began to have this tension, this worry, this nervousness about this event. Okay, so they begin to have some anxiety. Now, is this a legitimate reason for anxiety? Absolutely. It's, this is 100%. If you or I were in the same position, there would be 100% legitimate worry or concern. Okay? Anxiety, uh, more often than not, stems from legitimate concerns. It's not just, oh, well, you know, you're basically, uh, you know, listening to all the outside world and you're just piling on a bunch of worry, which that can increase anxiety. But many times, the anxiety that we experience comes from legitimate reasons to have anxiety. Okay, questions about leadership, the future, provision, these are all legitimate concerns. But Deuteronomy 31, verse number 6 we see that the, the, Moses gives a charge to the children of Israel. Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Moses knew and understood that there was going to be some anxiety about the future moving forward. Who the next leader was going to be, where they were going, right? And he addresses this fear immediately in this charge. I mean, very shortly after he announces, hey, I'm going to be gone, I'm stepping down. He ensures them and he addresses this problem. This, I don't know, maybe he could sense or feel it right away as he makes this announcement that there's start, people start talking, what, Moses is not, I thought he was going to, and the, you could just hear it. And so he addresses this immediately. Okay, so let's look at Joshua 1. Just flip forward a few pages, Joshua chapter 1. Joshua is the, the designated leader that is going to be leading the children of Israel. Thus begins the book of Joshua. 
Joshua 1, verse 1 and 2. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over to this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give them, even uh, to the children of Israel. New leadership. Just sometimes even saying that phrase can give people either flashbacks or some anxiety about that. Have we had a leadership change in the last few years? Yeah, and it just automatically brings questions, concerns, doubts, worry, anxiety. Is that legitimate? Absolutely. You have Moses, and now we have this young man, well, not so young, but younger man, Joshua. Well, is he going to be able to do everything Moses can do? Is he going to lead us in the same way? Is God going to bless him? I wonder if he's going to mess up. Okay, Joshua 1, verse 5 and 6, we'll keep reading. Verse number five, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide the inheritance of the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. God again puts to rest these feelings of anxiety to Joshua right away with a promise, just as Moses promise the people, the Lord, he's going to go with you. There's no need for you to be concerned. Here, Joshua gets the same encouragement from the Lord. I'm sure Joshua had these feelings. You're the next guy under Moses, okay? The odds are you are not going to be as good a leader as Moses. It's just not going to happen. The things that Moses did in Egypt, the things that Moses did in the wilderness, the part of the Red Sea, like Joshua was like, I, I, I don't even know how to swim. I mean, how am I supposed to be able to do all these things? Okay, I'm sure there was probably a feeling of insignificance and obviously anxiety. He's not going to be able to be Moses. The Lord never asked him to be Moses. He said he was going to be with him just like Moses. So let's turn to Psalms 56. We're going to look at a few more passages. Psalms 56. As you turn to Psalms 56, we don't have to necessarily go over a whole overview of David's life, but here in this passage, David is on the run as he spent many years of his life on the run, running from Saul, running from his enemies, running from people that hated him for almost no reason, right? And David just seems to be plagued with this emotion, this feeling of uncertainty, worry, unrest, nervousness, because he's always being hunted. What, what's, is it fight and flight is the emotion? He was constantly living in the, with that emotion, literally because he was always running and he was always fighting. So here, Psalms 56, verse number one and two. Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. Verse number two, mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for there be many that fight against me, O thou most high. David has this feeling of anxiety. Every single day he's on the run. Every single day he knows that there are people that are trying to kill him. Verse number three of chapter number 56. Were David's anxieties legitimate? Absolutely. But, verse number three, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Even when it seems that God's promises aren't being fulfilled, even when it seems uh, that every day has a new problem arising, David chose to put his trust in the Lord. We'll look at one final passage, John chapter 14, if you want to turn there. That whole uh, chapter, John chapter 14, is a, it's a comforting chapter. Jesus spent a lot of time with his disciples, teaching and training them. But as Jesus knew his time was getting nearer and nearer to his departure, to his crucifixion, um, he's going to be crucified, he's going to leave the disciples, the disciples have some real concerns, some real worries, some real thoughts, some real questions. And, I mean, put yourself in their shoes. I mean, Jesus Christ himself on this earth, you physically get to see him, to spend time with him. And then as Jesus gets closer to, he had, he had given some, I don't want to say hints, but he had spoken in some parables and things talking about uh, how he was going to depart, he was going to leave, how the temple was going to be torn down in three days and then built again. It was kind of vague. When you get here near his crucifixion, he tells the disciples, I'm going to be delivered up to be killed. 
and then I'm going to leave. Right there, the disciples, one, they don't see how it's possible because they've seen, how, seen the miracles that Jesus had done and they knew who he was. So there is, I'm sure the emotions are just wild. And they have all these questions and, and questions with no answers. And Jesus starts putting some of these to rest here in John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 16 through 18. This uh, response comes shortly after a question. John chapter 14, verse number 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth within you, and, ye, and shall be with you. Verse number 18, and I have this underlined, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Here, Jesus is putting some of these feelings of unrest, this nervousness, this worry. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. There are times in your life where you're going to feel stressed. You're going to feel anxious. You're going to have more questions than answers. But here Christ says, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, He is going to be with you forever. You can't lose the Holy Spirit. He's going to be with you forever, and I'm not going to leave you comfortless. Not just, I'm not going to leave you or forsake you. God's with you in the storm. We understand that. But here, the actual comfort of, of the Spirit of God, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. The thought that God ignores our anxiety or discredits it or dismisses it is untrue. But he does not leave us without a solution. Okay? Uh, then we, I'm, I'm going to move past these verses, but later on, if, read the whole chapter of John 14, but later on, verse 26 and 27, he talks about the Comforter coming. The last example that we're going to look at, and you don't have to turn there, is going to be Timothy uh, in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Paul gives Timothy an enormous task to help minister uh, in a church in Ephesus. This church was a large church. This church had with great uh, opportunities comes great problems, lots of different doctrines coming in, difficulty with leadership. And Paul gives young Timothy the challenge of being over this. And I, we don't see the correspondence from Timothy to Paul. We just see the correspondence of Paul to Timothy. I'm sure it was 101 questions for Paul. What should I do in this situation? What should I do in this situation? I don't think I'm capable to do this. I don't think I'm capable to do that. There was some real anxiety that uh, Timothy had. Paul puts that to rest, 2 Timothy 1, verse number 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. A few verses right before that, he, he ensures Timothy with, I know the faith that you have. It was in your grandmother, it was in your mother, and I know that it's in you. And you have the Spirit of God with you. He tells them that later. You have the Spirit of God. It's the same Spirit that was in me. It's the same Spirit that's in you. And it's not a spirit of fear. Timothy, I'm sure, had some, felt some inadequacies. Okay? He wasn't the Apostle Paul. He couldn't be like the Apostle Paul. And he was in a situation where it was probably bigger than what he thought he could handle. And it was in his own strength. But Paul encourages him that God hadn't given him the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So here's just a few examples in Scripture. A death of a leader, a new leader, doubts and fears due to circumstance, a testing of our faith, and unachievable goals. Although these are legitimate concerns and causes for anxiety, restlessness, worry, these things, uh, there's things that we can do to fuel that worry and that anxiety, and there's things that we can do to fight it. A little behind here. So what fuels anxiety? Simply fear. That is the number one fuel for anxiety, is fear. 1 John 4, 8. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. That turmoil that you feel inside, that restlessness, that worry, that when you wake up and you're sweating, you feel like the world is caving in on you. What does that torment come from? It comes from fear. Fear torments the soul. Romans uh, 8, 15. Uh, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, wherein we cry, Abba, Father, which is saying you've adopted. Whether you have a father or not in your life, you have a heavenly Father, which is better than any father. And it, we have that opportunity to cry to our heavenly Father. That Abba is a term of endearment. That uh, 
Fear is what fuels your anxiety. When Evelyn was first born, uh, when she began to start to be able to roll over, I had big time issues with this. It was ultimately fear that fueled my anxiety. I would wake up in the night and worry that, is she gonna roll over and suffocate? Because you hear, uh, was it SIDS? Cribs death and different things like that. It's a legitimate concern because it happens. And there's nothing that you can do about it. Even if you proper sleep habits and this and that, and you do so much research and you have a lot of just, it's honestly, it's just anxiety. It's fear, but it's legitimate. Because, I mean, you don't want your child to just die in the middle of the night, so I'd wake up and literally feel like almost like panic attacks and I'd have to check on her, check the monitor, make sure that she's okay. Okay, ultimately, it's fear. Fear of something bad happening. Fear of the unknown. Fear of whatever it is. It's fear that fuels this. Okay, how can we fight this? So here, all that, all, all that bad news, all that of what anxiety is, what fuels it, what fights it? Ultimately, faith. How do we increase our faith? Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Throughout passage of scripture, putting my faith in God in this area, I was able to combat this anxiety with fear. Or with faith, excuse me, not with fear. I'm going to put this, this up here. These are some passages that I went to that helped me. It, it, it's easy to just say, oh, you know, read these passages and put your faith in God and it goes away. It's not that easy. You have to put your faith and trust in God, not only for salvation, which is our you know, greatest trust and faith in God, but in the areas that we don't have control over, in the areas that we have questions or doubts and concerns. I'll read a couple of these passages. Isaiah 41.10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, be careful or care filled for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplications with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Uh, uh, Psalms 4, uh, verse number 8, this, this one is probably my favorite one. Uh, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Psalms 34, 4. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Psalms 27, 1. I have 1 through 4. I'm just going to read the one verse. The Lord is my light and mine salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? If you want those passages, I can uh, give them to you. You can look at them a little bit later. So how does anxiety, because we're talking about relationships. How does this anxiety affect my relationship? Anxiety shifts the focus from the relationships that we should be strengthening, a relationship with God, a relationship with others, to the problems that are happening. Anxiety clouds the mind. It interrupts our focus. It makes us honestly disconnected with anything and everything else and everyone else, including the Lord, when, when you have a problem, whatever it is, and you're anxious about it, you're, all your attention, your focus, your time is all towards either preventing that thing from happening or thinking about it or praying, even praying about it. You forget about everything and everyone else other than just that one problem because you have anxiety about it. Okay? In, uh, combat anxiety with the Word of God it is the only way to have victory in these different areas. It's easier said than done. I think all of us have things that we worry about, that we have anxiety about, that plague our mind, and they're legitimate. But combating those fears with faith by the Word of God is the only true way to be able to have victory in this area. Because it does affect our relationships. You're not yourself. You just feel like, I'm, I'm here, but I'm really not here because I'm mentally just thinking or worrying about something else. So I hope this was a help to you. This was a, a huge help to me, not necessarily this week, yes, this week, but as a young, as a young parent, having anxiety about my, my children, their protection, their safety. And these are some passages. I'll go back there and I'll leave them up. These are some passages that really helped me uh, with this uh, topic.